Hello and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. This is your host, Brian Funk, and I make music as Afro DJ Mac. And today I have a special interview with Rosalind McPhail. And she is a flutist. <laughs> we just talked about this before. Should I say flautist, flutist? I think I just want to say flute player <laughs> to be safe. But uh, welcome. How are you today? Oh, it's great to, great to finally meet you over Skype. Oh my yeah. gosh, I'm a huge fan of your work and wow, you've uh, you've taught me a lot over the years. Oh, thanks. That's that's awesome to hear. Um, sometimes you don't know where your work goes once you hit publish and uh, post and all of that stuff. So true. Nice. So true. Well, your presence is very important in the Ableton community. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, um You've got a lot of cool stuff going on right now. Can you tell us maybe just um, about yourself, your work, what you do, um, how you describe it and all of that? Probably do a better job than I would, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm based in St. John's, Newfoundland, which is, uh, gosh, it's pretty far north, pretty far east, one of the most eastern tips of North America, actually. And it's an island, we call it the Rock Hmm. And it's no small island, though, to tour to the mainland, uh, have to drive many, many hours across the island, and then take a many, many hours boat ride to the mainland. Uh, so we're really isolated. Um, I grew up on Toronto Island and uh, with hippie parents and was totally inspired by 70s music. And nice. gosh, I got my start with the flute, got my start with the flute because um, I'm asthmatic and I was really sick as a kid. And my grandmother read this great article about how playing wind instruments helps asthmatics learn how to control their breathing. Wow. So there you go. There happened to be a flute teacher down the street and I started playing flute. Now, fast forward many, many, many years, uh, I did classical training uh, for the majority of my life and kind of woke up one day, fed up with the classical music world and wanted to start writing my own tunes at the time. Like I, as a flutist, couldn't even imagine writing my own tunes and how, you know, how that would work because I th at that time thought in a very melodic way. And luckily, one of my friends actually gave me his classical guitar and said, take this home and just work with it. So I would practice in the middle of the night and I would, mm -hmm. you know, be completely embarrassed to share my music with anyone. <laughs> and about six months later, I decided to start documenting my journey as a songwriter. And so I recorded my first EP and then decided oh my gosh, like, I want to be incorporating my flute, like, enough of just voice and guitar. How can I do this with flute? And uh, funny enough, I saw an amazing performer, Owen Pallet, who used to go by the name Final Fantasy. And okay. he was looping his violin. And I was blown away by what he was doing. And so... I thought, okay, I can do this. I can loop with my flute. And I just got, you know, a little simple looping pedal that I would work with and started uh, studying at the band center and did a residency there where I just like jumped right into it and kept writing songs, kept documenting my songwriting journey through recording. Fast forward a couple more years and I went to the Atlantic Center for the Arts in Florida to study with Robert Dick. Now, Robert Dick is a fantastic flutist. He is, he's an inventor. He is just an amazing man. They, they call him the Jimi Hendrix of the flute because oh, there nice are like the most amazing sounds that this man creates. He's just brilliant. So I went to work with him. And there was just a select bunch of us. And he had handpicked all of these flutists who were also electronic artists uh, to study with him for three weeks. I don't know how I lucked out in this. Let's call it the universe divine intervention or something, because <laughs> I certainly wasn't that technology person at the time. <laughs> I just had my looping pedal. But while I was there, over the three weeks, everybody just kept saying, Rosalyn, you got to switch. you got to make the switch to Ableton Live. It'll totally transform everything that you do. And funny enough, I made the switch. And then um, 
it took me quite a while to to learn the basics. I even had to get help with MIDI programming. I had never even heard of MIDI before. Like, what a brilliant language. And uh, and funny enough, like, yeah, I just jumped right into it. And then, I, you know, it, what was really great about it is it allowed me to do my flute looping. It allowed me to incorporate sound design and, like, play with field recordings in my music. And I started to program my own MIDI rhythms, which was so great. That just, like, totally opened up my world. And then made the switch also to performing live music to silent film. And where I'm at right now is that that's kind of the medium that I'm most passionate about is creating these audiovisual projects where I use Ableton Live to create my live score. But I actually also use Ableton Live, even though it's not a video platform, to uh, project my films, my short films, and it works actually quite well. Mm. So it's been a crazy ride. Um, I'm, uh, gosh, where I'm at right now is I'm booking a bunch of tours. I'm going to be touring Eastern Canada and doing uh, some great clinics at the Long and the Quaid stores in Eastern Canada, teaching people how to loop with live. And uh, also really, really excited because I just got sponsorship. I got sponsorship with Gemeinhart Musical Instruments, and I'm just floored. I'm the first Canadian to be sponsored by that company. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I did see your unboxing videos, and uh, oh. yeah, the excitement was definitely apparent. Um, <laughs> and then it was then th there were some pretty cool flutes that you received too. Oh, they were so sweet to me. So what we're talking about is that I, I went on Facebook Live and I actually opened this humongous box from Gemeinhart just before Christmas. And it was the best Christmas present ever because it <laughs> had a bunch of sea flutes. It had a gorgeous Ellie Ryerson black alto flute, which is now my like favorite instrument. And this gorgeous storm piccolo too. It's just like, oh, it was like, just opening up everything for me in yeah. what I do to express myself musically. Yeah, that's incredible. And uh, it's, a, I guess, a great testament, too, of your work that, um, you know, they want to get their flutes in your hands. <laughs> it, it's an exciting moment. I, yeah. I had been dreaming for many years uh, to find the right company to work with. And I just lucked out. I was at the National Flute Convention last August and hit it off with Gemeinhart, they were fantastic people and I just think they're so innovative and progressive. All of their artists are completely unconventional flutists. They've got one of my favorite flutists in the whole wide world on their roster, Mr. Greg Pat <laughs> Greg Patillo. <laughs> Greg's gonna laugh when he hears me. <laughs> <Love his. laughs> But he's the, you probably all know of him as the beatboxing flutist. You can't miss him on YouTube. It's, he's totally viral and just does amazing things in the beatboxing flute world. That sounds very cool. I got to check that out. Yeah. You know, that's um, nice to hear because I think um, sometimes the, you know, the traditions um, can get a little stagnant where we're just kind of, we're not pushing forward, especially, I guess, like instruments like the flute and um, some of the more like classical orchestra band, you know, type of high school band, especially I see like um, that you're taught in that one tradition and it's nice to see um, a whole community of people embracing some new techniques and some new styles. Totally. totally. That's why I was really excited to, to join the mind heart because it's like every artist on that roster is doing something that's just totally outside of the box. Mm. And, um, yeah, those are the people I like to spend time with. Congratulations. Sounds like you're in good company. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> So you you threw in a lot of things there that I I'm, I've been taking some notes as I always do in case you're wondering what what I'm <laughs> what I'm doing as I turn away but uh um, but a lot of interesting things to start from um, and one of the things that you said right early in the beginning that I think is really interesting about the way life works is you you said you had asthma I, I and that that led you to playing the flute and it almost 
you know, my initial reaction would be it would almost take you out of the condension or out of like, you know, playing a wind instrument because it's so dependent on your breath.、Mm-hmm. And it's pretty cool to hear that something like that actually led you into your entire career and body of work. Just、Isn't、like that. that. It's just、uh, one of those things that kind of shows you、um, you really can never tell whether a situation is good or bad until it plays out for you a little for bit.、Sure. Yeah, it's funny that you say that,、uh, Brian, because、um, there's this book I'm reading right now that is just blowing my mind. It's called The Surrender Project,、hmm. and it's by Michael Singer. And he shares the story of his life and what he's accomplished and how he's gotten there. And it's all about surrendering to. A power that's bigger than us, that we don't totally understand, we can't quite grasp it. But I don't know about you, but for me, every moment in my life where I just let go, it's like that's when the magic happens.、Uh-huh. <laughs> just let go, right? And then boom, it's like, and the dreams that we accomplish are way bigger than what we can visualize. Well, I find a lot of the stress I feel personally. Tends to come from me resisting reality, <laughs> from me、yeah. kind of fighting things, especially things that I have no control over, where it's just this、um, not accepting the way things are. And then once you kind of you know, realize,、um, hey, this is how it is, and no matter how angry or mad or upset I get, it's still going to be this way,、um, it kind of like frees you up from that. Um, I mean, it's, sometimes it's very hard to get out of that, but it does sort of free you up to then take action and decide what to do with the situation instead of fighting it all the time. Totally, totally. I think my least favorite word these days is resistance. It's like <laughs> resistance creates so much pain, you know? Like trouble and pain. But it's like acceptance, on the other hand, is like such a magical thing. Yeah. Well, it's a philosophy I've used in a lot of places in my life, I guess, but、um, I do it with music a lot.、Um, sometimes, if、um, a recording doesn't come out as I'd hoped, or something goes in a weird direction, or、um, you know, I don't have, say, I hear a cool sound and I don't have a good microphone to record it,、um, to just sort of accept the situation, accept the recording for what it is, accept the sound, and just go with it.、Um, So, in this situation where I don't have a good microphone to record this really awesome sound, I just use my iPhone. It's what I have. And then live with the artifacts and the noise that come with maybe that kind of quality recording. And a lot of times it becomes like the character and the charm of that actual final product.、Um, when I was、um, first really doing like, you know, my. More serious home studio recording. We, a buddy of mine and I invested in、um, eight at machines, two sets of eight at machines, which you literally recorded onto a VHS tape, all digital. And、um, I remember having this like obsession with getting everything recorded perfectly and mixing everything <laughs> as it's supposed to. And it really held me back a lot. But there was this, this like one day when I said to myself, You know what? It's g o n n a sound pretty good no matter what. <laughs> you know, even if I do every amateur mistake and mess everything up and do it the wrong way, still, like, this stuff captures a pretty good quality recording. So I kind of let that go and just said, you know, it's g o n n a be good. It's g o n n a be better than what I had a couple months back, anyway. And、um, it just freed me up to actually make music. And instead of just fighting, you know, my own、um, inexperience, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And I think as artists, too, we can just become such perfectionists.、Mm-hmm. And you, you can、know. never get there <laughs> with art. <laughs> you can't ever achieve、yeah. perfection. Totally. Yeah. It, it's amazing that you say that. Like, I, I find、um, in the recording studio, there's so many happy accidents that happen.、Mm-hmm. That sounds like a really happy accident. <laughs> yeah. I think.、Um, I, I watched a lot of Bob Ross Joy of Painting <laughs> growing up when I would stay home from school sick. <laughs> and I, I loved that, that thing he would always do. I think he called it Happy Little Accidents or something like that. But he would kind of do a stroke and not know where it's going to go, but he would let it just come to life on its own. And to like just allow, th- I guess, accept, like you said, acceptance, allow things to become whatever they are. 
And that becomes, um, to me, that sort of is where the perfection comes in, where those inconsistencies, those mistakes, those ideas that you wouldn't have had if you didn't just kind of roll with whatever is unfolding before you. Oh my gosh, that's so true. Uh, funny enough, like, uh, so I'm, I'm doing this crazy challenge right now, the RPM challenge, and yes. it's happening worldwide. I, I'm not yeah, sure. Tell us about that. Brooklyn, like, do they yeah, it's a great challenge, yeah. Yeah, cool. Tell us, tell us. I don't know uh, what it stands for, um, but you know, I, I know, I do know the concept. I've been hearing of people doing it for years, but tell us all about it. Yeah, I think it's a record per month or something. Anyway, I should look that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been doing the RPM challenge for a number of years now. So basically, what what you're supposed to do is you're suppo supposed to record a certain number of minutes within the month of February, and they encourage you to write original music. So the songs can be written before that, and you can just do the recording of them, but bonus points for folks who write, <clears throat> excuse me, write and record during the month of February. So it like the challenge is crazy because I mean, life happens and I don't know about you, but February is like one of the busiest months for me for every aspect of my life whether it's, you know, grant applications, tour booking, you know, reaching out to festivals, just all of these different things all seem to happen during the month of February when I've got this big challenge. <laughs> and it's a short month, no less. <laughs> and it's the shortest month of the freaking year. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, th this year I decided I was going to do a bit of a different project um, and it was inspired by this beautiful Gemeinhardt alto flute that I've been playing. And it's called Love and Let Be. And it's a yin yoga album, which I like I've never, never written music for yin yoga before, but I love practicing yoga. And I remember seeing this amazing teacher from Halifax, Moksha Yoga Halifax, Jen King, who came into our studio and she was teaching this class that was inspired by one of my favorite poems called The Invitation by Araya Mountain Dreamer. And this class was just like such an amazing experience. It was profound. It was like heart opening. It was super, super inspiring. So that was last March. And I had been thinking about it over and over and over again, just how much this, this experience was sitting with me. And I was like, I really want to collaborate with this woman. So weird how our moments of inspiration happen. <laughs> I'm like sitting in the bathtub, <laughs> taking a bath. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm like, ding, I need to do a yin yoga album meant for home practice so that on the days when me or my friends or anyone I know in the community can't get to their class, they can practice their yin yoga at home and have something super inspiring that could possibly help them feel a little bit lighter, maybe open up their heart a little bit more. And it kind of goes along the lines of, you know, how stressful it's been reading the news, seeing what's going on in the world right now. It's, yep. it's a really unsettling time for all of us. And it's really hard to get away from it. And I thought to myself, okay, for the RPM challenge, if Jen's up for it, I want to do this album to help the world and to just make it a little bit lighter. Yeah. So anyway, I reached out to her. I was terrified. I reached out to her. She was all over it. And then I was like, okay, but there's this other stumbling block. Like we don't have permission from the, the poet Araya Mountain Dreamer. I reach out to her. She writes to say yes. It's like ding, ding, ding. Everything's in the flow, right? So in January, I got an engineer in Halifax to record Jen teaching this class to four people in the room in his recording studio. And they just recorded this one hour class. Well, the reason why I'm bringing up this story is that I get these this track back uh, <laughs> in St. John's and I'm like, 
oh my gosh, there's so much noise. Oh my gosh, I hear a dog running up the stairs. Oh no, like, <laughs> and there's like all these different sounds. Oh my gosh, how am I going to fix this? Like, because I got this at the beginning of February and it was like, oh no, I don't have what I need to start this recording. All the inspiration is coming from this class. <laughs> like, what am I going to do? And I reached out to an engineer in St. John's who I love, Steve Lilly. And Steve worked his magic on the track to really clean it up. But what I love about what he left is that he left all those moments where there's all those sound samples of the dog running up the stairs and mm -hmm. the dog running in around the room and hearing people moving in their poses. And it just... It's that happy accident, right? Right again, you know, like there's just all these beautiful moments that we can take out of our recordings. And I think those imperfections are what make those recordings magical. Yeah, that's life happening. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, people living and breathing. And sometimes you can lose that real easily when you're recording in the computer and everything's MIDI and sampled and it's perfect and clean. And there's suddenly like, nobody like breathing there's nobody like no one's like shirt moving a little bit in the microphone which you might not even hear in the final recording but it just creates this kind of like this happened somewhere feeling yeah it's something i'm always thinking about and i usually wind up just putting noise or weird recordings in the background of my stuff is it needs to like be somewhere and, yeah. and that takes you there, I guess. And those sound like appropriate sounds. What What is yin yoga exactly? I, I've, you know, I love doing yoga myself. I'm very informal about it. But I've never heard of yin. Yeah. So yin, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a yin teacher, so I don't know if I'm explaining it perfectly. But what I love about yin is that it's about release. It's about letting go or letting be. Really, that's why we call it love and let be because it's, it's just accepting the moment kind of what you know the train we've been on through this conversation mm -hmm. so far it's all about that about lying in these poses most of them are lying down or sitting uh very few are standing poses and you're in the poses for a lot longer so it's like all of a sudden your body is just able to release and it's amazing the chatter that happens in the mind at the same mm -hmm. time it's just it's a neat experience, and, and what I love about Jen's class is that it's all about opening the heart. And so far, I've spent the last two weekends, three days in a row each weekend, just being in, like, hardcore record, recording mode in a, in a rehearsal space. And hearing her class and practicing the yoga as I'm, like, trying to record and as I'm trying to mix has been a really beautiful experience. So that's cool. So you're really involved in it too yourself. It's not just, it's, it makes me think of, um, you know, the old cliche of like the person in the band never gets to be in the dance, but you're, <laughs> you're kind of getting to do that. You're having the cake and eating it too, sort of. <laughs> really, and this is actually the first recording I've done that way, but it, it kind of dawned upon me as I was like, I, I first started with the Omnichord. I love the Omnichord. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have so many different ones. And so I was like determined to, you know, start with the Omnichord. And then I went into the keys and, and uh, you know, also actually used your haze uh, stuff, oh, which was nice. really cool. <laughs> Talk about <laughs> <know> imperfections. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and funny enough, what I did is I actually took a beat from one of my Omnichords, a, a bossa nova beat and I put it through haze and all of a sudden it like created this crazy drone hmm. and it's actually really like it's the meat. It's kind of like the heartbeat of the entire recording, which is really wow. cool. <laughs> yeah. That's but, awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Right. I like, had no you, idea that would happen. <laughs> you know, it's gonna, yeah. you know, get inspired along the way. But, um, but as I've been doing this, so like I laid down the omnichords and I laid down the keys and the whole time, like I'm listening to the class, but it's not like, it's not resonating. And the thing is too, that it's 65 minutes long. Mm -hmm. 
So like to try to find the flow of that without having any time to prepare myself for writing, like just jumping in and writing and recording at the same time, has just been such a crazy experience. So here I record all these parts and then I'm like, okay, I want to lie down on my yoga mat and I'm going to see how this sounds. And I was horrified. I was like, oh my gosh, this, this mix won't work at all. Like this is not what I want to be listening to as I lie down on my mat and like try to open my heart and let go. Mm. <laughs> so then I had to completely change my approach and it slowed me down by a day. Um, I was, you know, supposed to be on schedule for recording flute as of last Friday and I couldn't, I couldn't get to it, man. I had to, I had to remix everything. And then, uh, yeah, last two days I've been doing alto flute and just geeking out, but affected alto flute, which is really, really fun. Well, thank you again for taking the time to talk. It sounds like (laughs) maybe I'm helping you procrastinate a little. (laughs) Uh, I do have to listen to those mixes. (laughs) (laughs) But that's pretty interesting how... um, I, this idea like your music is for a very specific purpose here. And, um, you know, a lot of times when we make music, we don't necessarily have a purpose for it. It's just music. It's for listening. And the, But so much of how we experience music is the environment we're in, the activities we're doing, and whatever else is surrounding it. So to, I, I mean, I imagine what you did was still pretty interesting and fun on some level, but when you put it in the scope of that activity, how you had that feeling of like, uh oh, this is uh not fitting. It's such a sensitive yeah. And I don't know about you when you're composing, but for me I do need something that's inspiration, whether it's mm. a place, an experience, a feeling, um, a painting, a poem, a great film, whatever it is, I just I need something that I just kind of create around. I do that a lot. I, I have myself, um, and I kind of laugh at myself sometimes when I'm doing my, um, I teach for Berkeley online and I review people's assignments and I find myself talking all these like weird ass abstract things like this sounds like a, a carnival floating down a swamp, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> I feel like I'm in, I'm in a spaceship that's underwater, you know, I, I, all these like weird things come out of my, my mind when I listen, but I do find like, kind of like creating this world is so important. And what you mentioned about, um, and it may, I don't mean to bounce around too much, but you were talking about your performances with the silent film. Sometimes I find just having something going in the background really does help it might be just like a movie with the volume off it might just be some visuals or um sometimes uh, i'll even like load in certain um devices max for live uh stuff that just generates visuals just to kind of pull me into it and i don't know um because i know when i look at the um interface for you know ableton live or whatever i'm using it becomes technical and you see each part coming along the timeline. You see, oh, here comes that sound. And, and it does, it stops becoming like um, music in a way. And it just becomes like, there's a sound wave. There's another sound wave coming. And it, that zaps me out of the moment and the inspiration. So I try to find ways to get away from that, whether it's not looking at the screen or finding something else. But yeah, that's... that's I've got a question for you. Yeah. So uh, when you're recording or working on an important project, like how do you feel about having technology around you? Do you turn everything off so that you're not distracted or do you keep in close contact? Like like my phone or something like that? Yeah, like just everything. Like I'll give you an example. Like for the last three days, I have found it so refreshing to be in this rehearsal space recording where I just like shut out the world, like just shut it off and just got to kind of be in my own head, be in my own heart. It felt amazing. <laughs> I like that too. Um, and a lot of the music and a lot of like my growth making music happened in the basement of my parents' house. And it wasn't a finished basement. It was... Um, you know, it was 
suitable enough. But there was no phone down there. I didn't have a cell phone at the time. No one did. Um, there was no internet. I didn't have a computer. And I would go down there, and it was like, I'm gone. You know, I'm in another world. And there were no windows, really, even. And, and in fact, I had, um, I'd either have an air conditioner in the window if it was summertime, or I had, um, like, insulation <laughs> just in the window to keep it warm in the winter. Yeah. So I couldn't tell what time of day it was. And I sometimes wouldn't know until I opened that door and walked outside. And there would be times when I went in at night and came out and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like the birds are chirping. And, but that kind of like, you know, I feel like I have a pretty good sense of time. I can wake up in the morning pretty much without an alarm clock. I set one anyway, just to be safe, but I'm good like that. I, I, I just have that. And, um, when I'm doing music though, and I'm in those zones and when everything's off and there's nothing to distract me, I, you know, I don't know how long I've been doing it for anymore. And that's, that's, I think like a really cool space to be. And in some ways I think that's like one of my favorite things about doing music in general. <laughs> and a lot of the activities that I like to do is that it takes me out of like this, like passage of time. And like you said, like everything's popping up and zapping at you and trying to get your attention. It's it's so easy to lose um, the moment, you know? And I've gotten that out of just doing the podcast too. Um, sitting down with you talking for the last half hour. How often do you get an uninterrupted half hour conversation with people? Um, well, it's pretty rare. Like even if your phone buzzes in your pocket, you know, it, that's something, oh, maybe that's so-and-so, maybe that's this, maybe that's that. And that little spark in your mind you know, who knows where that's going to take you. And yeah. um, I think we are always in those moments where it's really hard to like have dedicated, focused attention on anything with anyone, even yeah. just yourself. Yeah. I mean, our minds are bad enough. There's notifications going in our minds constantly. But then when we have all these devices that are really good at remembering things and really timely, I, I think it's something like you have to decide to like shut out things a little bit. Totally. Totally. Have you, um, have you ever done any artist residencies? Artist residencies? Yes. Um, how do you mean? So I, and maybe it's different over here, <sighs> but there, growing up, there were a lot of opportunities as a classical flutist, especially to go to a center and do a residency where you, you get a place to practice and a place to leave all your gear out. Oh. And, and so I've gone to the Banff Center many, many times, and it's really helped me develop my career. And I compare these moments that we're talking about with residencies, and um, I can't rave about them enough. And I think more electronic music producers should go and do these residencies because You'll get your own studio and you just get to yeah, be immersed in it. You don't have to worry about your day-to-day -day activities because all you're focused on is your creativity. And like at the BAM Center, they, they cook for you. They clean for you. Wow. Like <laughs> It's amazing that you get this hut in the woods. And, and I, that's my favorite. And I find when I'm able to jump into opportunities like that, that's when the creative juices really fly. Well, I can't say I've had anything formal like that, but um, a lot of the things I've done have resembled that. You know, like I said, in a way, the basement has always yeah. been sort of like a residency where you go, <laughs> yes. everything's there, it's set up, and it's, you know, I'm out of the world. I'm, actually, I'm literally underground right now. <laughs> and, um, and it's also been um, when we were in college, I was in playing with a bunch of my friends and they were all going to SUNY Purchase upstate New York and um, they had like a spot and we would just go there and you know we we could leave things we could or we could just leave it in the dorm and bring it over but it was like these really nice spaces to play friends basements have served as like recording studios in the past and yeah the the idea of like kind of going away is I love that I would love to like um take little vacations like that sometimes to just go and make music. Um, a lot of uh, the bands I, I watched growing up would have like little things like that. I, 
can remember a few where they just kind of go away and they're in a they're in a house and that that's the house they're making music, and yeah. and that's it. Nothing else is going to happen for like two weeks or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you find like in your day to day life? Like, how how easy is it to to manage finding those creative times? It's it's hard. It's very hard. Um, it's one of the biggest challenges finding the time. But um, I think you have to be kind of disciplined about it. Um, you, uh, you can't wait until everything's perfect. It's never going to be. And I, I do a lot of like kind of fooling myself <laughs> where I'll say like, all right, if I just do like 10 minutes, I'll be good. <laughs> you know, that's all. That's my goal for today. Just 10 minutes. <laughs> and, you know, once you get in, um, if you can convince yourself for that, like it within 10 minutes, I usually find something to get excited about and drawn into. So it, it's a way I kind of fool myself when I don't really feel like doing it. Mm -hmm. It's funny. Like I always feel like doing music in my head, I think. But when like I do get the time, I, I cannot find a hundred other things like that. I feel suddenly are really urgent, you know, better do those dishes. I better, you know, <laughs> clean that up. I better, you know, organize my wires or something. And, like it's really easy to find excuses to not oh, do it. Laundry becomes really important. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's it's funny how creative you can get to like kind of avoid it, and it's and it is something I love, but it, there's still a work element to it. And the starting is my my biggest hurdle is getting started. So I try to trick myself um, with. Uh, just a few minutes, that's all. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's great. Um, yeah, I'm actually doing a 30-day flute challenge with my flute students right now. Yeah, you mentioned that to me um, a couple months back when we first started interacting, um, and I wanted to talk to you about that. Um, oh. Yeah, because I thought it was great, and I, I love, too, that you are also involved in it. Yes, I think right? that's, I, you know, I teach high school English, um, and... When you get involved, when you get invested in things, um, it makes a difference. So tell us. It's a game changer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, 30 Day Flu Challenge. I, you know, all of my students love it. Uh, I think it has something to do with the candy that they receive at the end of the month. <laughs> That's one. And how old are they? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, the do youngest range? one is seven and the oldest uh, one is in her 60s. So it's a real contrast uh -huh. of uh, ages that I teach. But they all love the flu challenge. Um, in past years, I've given them a uh -huh. number of minutes that they have to play their flute every day. I'm not sure why I've been such a stickler about that. But, uh, but this year, I decided to do it differently. I just want them to pick up the flute and play. Uh -huh. Like... Uh -huh. I, I don't know if, if my teaching is changing over the years and I'm just becoming nicer as I get older. <laughs> but um, but it, it's one of those things where, to me, what's really important is that they just learn how to be disciplined enough to pick up their instrument every day. What they choose to do with it is really up to them. And hopefully they're having more creative freedom thinking about having fun. So there's no real rules per se except that they've got to pick up their flute and play every day but as i say that i've had to do this as well because one thing i learned over the years is you know it's great that everybody's into doing the flute challenge but if the teacher isn't doing the challenge well what kind of role model am i being and how can i really share my personal experiences that will help them grow if i am not having these experiences so I found it's a really great way to connect with my students for all of us to feel like real human beings with real challenges um, and to, you know, put it all out there and try to help each other succeed, to be each other's, you know, number one fan. Um, and so far, I guess I'm two weeks of the way through the challenge. And uh, one of my favorite parts of the challenge is putting the stickers on my calendar. I love it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I think most of the adult students really enjoy the stickers. <laughs> yeah, well, I tell you what, I, I, I've heard someone tell me uh, 
about teaching students like in school age. Uh, what works with kindergartners works with seniors and uh, a sticker, a stamp, you know, that's enough to get them excited. <laughs> You'd think they're too cool for it by now, but no. <laughs> Gotta have some fun, right? Gotta have some fun. That's, mm. that's what it's all about in my eyes. Well, it's, it sounds really nice. It does a few things that I find work in a lot of ways. Um, it's got the, uh, first of all, just the challenge. It is, I mean, it's easy to meet that challenge to play just a little bit every day. You know, it's not, it's not the kind of thing where if you, um, uh, how would I say? It's not too overwhelming to uh, participate in, you know? where if it was like, you know, I have to work out an hour every day, like that, yeah, that's going to fall apart fast. Um, yeah. But it's, so it's got, it's attainable. Yeah. It's realistic. Um, yeah. It's got the social accountability and yeah. also the like support of other people. Like, She's doing it. He's doing it. You know, I should, I, I could do it too. I think that's really big and really helpful. Yeah. Although I beg to differ, man. It's really, really hard to pick up my flute every day when life gets crazy. I, I find even just picking it up, like getting it out of the case sometimes, like I have to look at my clock and I'm like ready for <laughs> bed. And I'm like, nope, I made a promise to myself. I've got to stick to this. And then I think about all my students seeing a missing sticker on one of those days. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's like, I got to get up and practice the and I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. But I do, like, sometimes I find it really hard, like, wearing so many hats as musicians, is like, it just can be tough. Yeah. Like, I don't know how many jobs you have, but for myself, like, I teach private flute lessons. I love it. It's one of my passions in life. Then I'm, you know, I also do office admin work. I'm an executive director for the Canadian Federation of Musicians here in Newfoundland and Labrador. And so I've got to wear that hat on two days a week. And then, you know, in the midst of that, I'm like my booking agent because I'm trying to get these tours ready. And, and the list just goes on and yeah. on and on. And I just find sometimes it's really hard to take moments for ourselves to get balanced again. It's just this nonstop process. How about yourself? Like you're, you're on the go all the time too. Yeah, well, I can relate to that. And there are definitely times when I'm... I'm doing a lot of music work and then I realize I haven't made music in quite a while. You know, <laughs> I'm doing all this music related work, but uh, where's the music? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is like the, the goal is not um, too, too large to accomplish, but you're right. Like even just finding a little bit of time, you know, day after day after day is really challenging. Yeah, and, that consistency is hard. And it is something you have to push yourself. I kind of believe that discipline is a little bit like a muscle where you kind of get better and better at it the more you do it. Yeah. Um, whether or not that's true, I, I, I like to believe it is because I, I know how I am. When I get on a roll, I don't want to break it. <laughs> so yeah. there's that going too. Um, do you feel the flow that happens too? Like I always notice that when I'm really, really disciplined, when I'm like keeping my challenge, you know, doing my scales, whatever I need to do, it's like all of a sudden, I don't, you know, once again, like this bigger power than what I am aware of, but it's like the universe just shines me with gifts, whether it's opportunities that I wouldn't have been prepared for had I not done that disciplined practice. Mm -hmm. It's it's really amazing how it just all seems connected and all flows really beautifully when we're disciplined and dedicated. Yeah, I guess you're focused on that goal and then, you know, you kind of act like a person that could do that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I one of uh, a quote I love, it's so simple, I don't even know who said it, but, um, you know, those who think they can and those who think they cannot are both right. And to say, like, you know, if you think you can do something, you're going to act like a person that can do it. And yeah. that might mean messing up 25 times. But if you think you can do it, you're going to keep doing it because you think you can. <laughs> and if you yeah. don't, you're going to not even try. You're just, yeah. you're not going to get anywhere. Yeah. So I think, like, again, maybe it's like tricking yourself a little bit into believing it. But when you... um 
Uh, it's like uh, you are whatever you do, sort of. Like um, you, you're a musician when you're playing your your instrument. You're a musician when you're working on your tracks. You're you know, I'm I'm a podcast host right now because I'm doing it now. But when I stop, <laughs> I'm no longer that. Yeah, you know that was what I was, and um, to like kind of. Um, be the thing you are now you know that's what you are you know that's you're an artist now you're making art um yeah, yeah. i think um one of my art teachers in high school said that you know she said you know you're if you're making art you're an artist like that's what you are you know it doesn't matter if it's good or bad it's you're doing it and that's you're on that path and i yeah. found that like really inspiring and also um really like freeing you know because there's a lot of like um you know, self-doubt that goes into all this stuff and questioning your work and, you know, am I really any good at what I do? And that that's like almost always not far from the surface. Yeah. But the idea that like, oh, you're just, you're doing it. And like part of it is doing it poorly and part of it's doing it well. And, um, but still showing up. It's showing up is like, yeah, that's, yeah. I guess, the biggest thing. That you just got to keep showing up, keep working you know, your, your results may come big in one week and then it might not seem like much is happening. It might even seem like you're stepping back, but sometimes you got to do that. And yeah. I think like, um, to apply that to what you said about the yin yoga music you're making, you realized that you had to take a step back and start over a little bit. Yeah. And, and I don't think that that time you spent working on the stuff that maybe doesn't ultimately work out is wasted time. It was just, you had to figure that out first. Yeah, it's so. true. It's kind of like you have to carve your way into the groove before you can kind of get in the groove, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's it's weird. It's And sometimes it's really easy. <laughs> it just kind of flows, and sometimes it's it's work, and sometimes you realize you've started carving in the wrong direction. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you would never know that until you got there. Yeah. Yeah. To to true. see that kind of stuff, those setbacks as part of the progression, I think is helpful too. Mm -hmm. If you can, you know, it's <laughs> I feel like I'm just like fooling myself all the time <laughs> talking to you right now, but like you kind of <laughs> like just remind yourself that it's part of that. And then pretty soon my brain's gonna catch you're just tricking me. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're doing. This isn't gonna be ten minutes. <laughs> I hope so, I don't catch on to myself. <laughs> It's so funny you say that because, um, so I have this really great mentor here, Miranda Squires, who's a yoga instructor, and uh, she talks about the super ego, and the super ego is that parrot on the shoulder that's like, you're not good enough, you're not ready for this, blah, 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 mm -hmm. and it's so funny how many times, especially when we're under pressure, that that parrot on our shoulder is just ready to be our least yeah. favorite man. <laughs> Oh yeah, you know it's like <laughs> that, that. That parrot is always ready to volunteer a comment, but I think um, in the heat of the moment, a lot of times that parrot kind of goes away too. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I learned this, um, you know, while performing. I think um, in a couple of areas, I guess. But like, you know, you're nervous, you're nervous, you're nervous for the show, and then you get on stage and you kind of like get in the zone. You kind of, you know, that, that goes away somehow and you don't even notice it happen, but you just, I think you go through it. You, what happens is you start performing and now you're back in your practice, this thing you've done over and over again. Yeah. And I've yeah. found it recently, um, in taking like a self-defense martial arts class for the first time. And I, I started, it was almost five years ago now, but I, you know, it was recent enough where I remember how much of a beginner and how afraid I was um, where, you know, you practice like a technique or something and then, you know, you're afraid to actually go and put it to work until you're there and then you fall back on the, the practice and that sort of becomes where your mind uh, goes. It's because I think under those stressful moments of performance or whatever it is when you have to actually do something um, that, you f have to fall back on something and hopefully your practice is strong enough for doing that. So like you said, if you're, <laughs> if you're prepared enough, 
you know, like all that work you've done has gotten you ready for the situation, then that's what you fall back on. Yeah. Hopefully. Thank goodness, thank goodness that happens. <laughs> Funny though, as we speak about that, I mean, I'm discovering, especially when it comes to writing and recording, that the more I can step outside of my comfort zone and not rely on that warm, fuzzy blanket around me, that all of a sudden I can do really unique and special things mm. that resonate with others. You get comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I just, I, I find it's really helping to change change my sound like it yeah I, I guess it's how we evolve as artists you know yeah I saw um, a TED talk that I showed to my my students once in, in high school um, and I gotta see if I can find it again because I did have a few people say it kind of affected them but he was talking about um, stepping outside your comfort zone and every time you do that zone becomes a little bit wider and you get more and more comfortable being uncomfortable and I've heard people say um, that a person's success is often related to the amount of um, unpleasant or uncomfortable conversations they're willing to have. Like there's some connection with that. And, <laughs> and again, like it kind of says that like if you can get yourself in these situations and be comfortable in all kinds of areas, or, or at least be comfortable being uncomfortable in all kinds of areas, that it can be very helpful for your growth because that's where it all happens, right? Yeah. Um, one of my favorite yoga instructors says the best teachers are the ones that make you feel like you have a warm sweater on the hottest day of the summer. Hmm. So it's like, you know, yeah, like it's comforting the sweater all around me, but it's the hottest day of the summer. I want right, it off, right. <laughs> you know. And uh, I use that a lot when I'm thinking about my creativity, when I'm thinking about my teaching, how I'm working with others. It's like, yeah, that's the real deal, right? Yeah, that's that's a nice way to put it too. Yeah, and and yoga is pretty cool like that. And it's one thing I love about it is because you're trying to stay relaxed and calm and yet you are sometimes under a lot of stress you know trying to hold the certain positions and uh, the kind of yoga i like a lot are the kinds that kind of keep you in the poses a long time yeah and um yeah after like some time you're like oh man this is like tough but you it, it's so much practice and staying calm focusing on the breathing and and uh softening and loosening and elongating where you're supposed to and um to kind of have that to come back to in those difficult times i think is so important to have that like to feel calm under stress <laughs> yeah yeah it's such an important practice right yeah and I, I mean i do think yoga is one of the best um forms of exercise to do because it's so much of that and it's so um beneficial not only just physically but mentally in the yeah. um in the calm aspect under stress yeah i agree well and you know in newfoundland like we have brutal winters man and like going to the hot yoga studio hmm. <laughs> and feeling like i'm in summertime every time i take a class oh it's yeah awesome. right <laughs> it's a good escape <laughs> yeah it's a great escape <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, that's cool. I look forward to hearing what you do with the um, with the music for um, the Yin Yoga. That's that should be interesting. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's kind of a crazy time because I have to have this done by March first, so yeah. I'll be posting it online, and then as soon as that's done, I'm jumping into a new album uh, called Get Your Flute On, <laughs> and that's going to be uh, flute loops uh, with a bunch of really great electronic music producers who are contributing some cool electronics that I'm going to be inspired by. So that'll be the next project. <laughs> Very nice. So you've already got it lined up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you I know? think that, you know, with, music especially it's very easy to never finish <laughs> you can always tweak and having some 
you know, deadline, whatever it is, even if it's self-imposed, really does make a big difference. Yeah. Because, and uh, I always find like starting that at the beginning of a year really helps keep my momentum going. Mm -hmm. So that's why the RPM challenge is one of my favorite things to do, even though it's always really stressful for the month of February, but it's like kind of getting that first recording under my belt for the year, the one that I'm like really passionate about and, and can, you know, just try something really new. Then after that, I'm like, okay, I've done my experimenting now. Time to jump into a bunch of other projects that are going to ignite some hmm. you know, cool energy. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to look at it. And that um, you are getting to, um, as you said, it's so busy. So if you can do it in February, that's kind of inspiring for the rest of the year to say, well, I, you know, look, I had a short month, busy month. Yeah. I think there's something to be said about ha being like um, pressed for time. Um, and I go through this every single year. As a teacher, we have off um, July and August. Yeah. And I always think that's going to be my most productive times. But what I find is that um, since I have what seems like so much time, it's very easy to put things off. It's mm -hmm. very easy to say, ah, nah, you know, I'll just hang out, I'll just do whatever. There's a lot of fun things to do in the summer too. And it's really easy to just kind of let it slip by. Whereas when I start my school year again and everything's scheduled and regimented and limited, I find I have to really squeeze the most I can out of every few minutes that I have. And I think in a weird way, I actually get more done with less time. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah, I would say when I'm, when I'm working on a lot of different things, all of a sudden I really value my time a lot more too. Yeah. Yeah. Huh, yeah. that's interesting. Well, I guess um, that applies to a lot of things, right? I mean... Um, you know, when I only had one guitar, <laughs> if uh, something happened to that guitar, that was the end of the world in a way. But uh, now if you've got a few more lying around, it's like, okay, well, I'll move on. The, you know, <laughs> if we were starving and we had one piece of bread compared to, you know what I'm saying, I guess. Totally. The scarcity makes it more valuable. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true for everything. I agree with you. Mm. Hmm. Then that's, I guess, why I think deadlines are important because <laughs> <laughs> you have to like make something, you know, because there's nothing that's really telling me I have to do anything. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like there's some like, you know, jobs and work I sign up to do, but, you know, if I didn't sign up to do it, I mean, there's not really like a boss. There's no one telling me, you know, I have to do this or that by the end of the day. So you have to tell yourself a lot of that. Yeah. Do you ever create uh, vision boards? What is it? Do you vision ever boards? Vision board? Yeah. I don't think in the formal way. Um, <laughs> but I definitely, I, I have, um, you know, I got this, I, have, I do a lot of notebooks. So I've got like vision notebooks, maybe, uh, you know, yeah. like a teaching one, a music one, a working out one. Like I, I tend to have a lot of that going on. Cool. But, um, yeah. Is this where you kind of like putting all of your projects on a board to uh, uh, tell me about it? Maybe I have the wrong idea. Uh, like vision boards, I, everybody I've ever sat with and done a vision board with has done it differently. So I think, you know, whatever you want it to be can be mm -hmm. possible. But for me, what I tend to do is I'll pick like certain areas of my life that I want to focus on. And I'll do this every couple of months. Um, you know, last summer, I was really sick. I had shingles. I got it while I was touring. And oh my gosh, it really set me back. Mm -hmm. And so I was really focused on my health. And I had like a whole like half page of the board was all, you know, healthy pictures, healthy sayings you know, just anything to focus on my health goals and I swear by it because, well, I'm healthy now. <laughs> mm. um, but, you know, other things too, like uh, when it comes to my career, like I'll break it down to my flute studio and I'll break it down to, you know, where I want to be performing or what projects I want to be working on. And I'll just write it all down, put pictures up there. The reason why I shared is that 
it's kind of spooky how much comes true on those vision boards for me. Uh, right down to what award I win or, you know, where I'm performing exactly. Um, I even put down on my vision board, I used to drive a, a 91 Buick station wagon with wood paneling. It was my favorite car. It was my nice. first car. <laughs> and uh, I'd like great. that wood paneling to come back in style. <laughs> like, come yeah. on, <laughs> manufacturers, come on, make wood paneling. And um, so anyway, this car was with me for, you know, a lot of my, my touring days and it was really hard to let it go. But at the time I knew that the repairs were just getting too expensive and my mechanic was like, oh my gosh, Rosalyn, like you have to give up this car. <laughs> but on my vision board, I started putting down the names of the vehicles that I was going to get and I even listed, you know, how much it's going to cost me and like, just like really narrowed it down. And amazingly enough, one of those names, this Subaru <laughs> appeared in my life. I didn't even have to pay for the vehicle. It was given to me by a friend. It was like, wow. it was an amazing gift, but it, I just goes to show like our mind is so powerful. And it's like, if we envision what we want to achieve, and we can write it down and we can, you know, even have a visual of what it looks like or what it feels like or how it makes us feel like the reaction of, of being a part of that. It's amazing that we can accomplish all of those things. Like it's kind of spooky though. Like anytime mm -hmm. I've, you know, looked at my vision boards from six months ago to a couple of years ago, so much of it has come true. It's yeah, it's nuts. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I definitely believe that there's a lot of value to visualizing things and um, imagining like what it would, down to like very specific details, you know, what something would be like. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's helps you focus and um, act again, like towards those types of things. Um, how you got the car for free is, sounds a little magical and, <laughs> like, <laughs> but, uh, well, like I'm writing down how much it's going to cost me and all of a sudden a friend's like I'm going to be taking this to the scrapyard why don't you you know yeah, just get some of the repairs done to get it up to par and right. you're well, and but, it's a great car <laughs> yeah maybe you, you also put yourself out there as someone that would want something like that and that was uh, part of it just uh, to have the mission clearly stated yeah and you know what's so neat about it too is, okay, so here we go of like visualizing what we want. But the other thing I'm noticing over and over again is like I can have a visual of what I want, but I'm limiting myself if that's all I want. It's like hmm. because most of the time those things that I want, there's something way bigger and better for me in store that I just can't see. Right. So it's like, we can visualize it, we can, we can sit with it, feel it, all of that kind of stuff. But then it's like, we also have to surrender and let it go. And when we let it go, then if it's meant to happen, it's going to come to us or it can be something way bigger that we just, yeah, didn't know about. I definitely think that we have a lot of like self-limiting beliefs that we carry around um, mm -hmm. that, you know, we'll only be able to do this or get that far. And, um, it's, it can, it can certainly like uh, rule your life. It can definitely keep you from trying new things or taking chances, uh, you know, keep you playing things safe and a little, yeah. maybe too conservative in certain areas. Um, but, uh, it's, it's hard to, uh, see and to know when you, you're putting those on yourself. And, uh, I think things that you do that, um, challenge yourself and push you past places you never really thought you could be are really powerful for that. Yeah. Um, you know, and I could take this back to when I started playing guitar myself at 14. I mean, I really, I knew nothing about music. I really didn't. I mean, I didn't know that singers were singing notes. I didn't know that if I had a guitar, I could play the songs I heard on the radio. Like, I just didn't know that stuff. I'd, I'd never seen anyone really do it and explain it to me. So just, you know, 14 years of my life, those thoughts never occurred to me. 
so it was so like foreign and mysterious and but also like inspiring to realize oh like i could do that like the first time i ever played a little melody on the guitar to like oh i could do that and um it's funny um i kind of prided myself like to myself when i first started playing guitar like i remember like i played every day for so many days in a row like since i started i've i've played guitar every single day since i started trying to learn and it was like it might have only been a few minutes here might have been there but i made it a point that i had to play it every single day even if it was just a little bit and it taught me that you can go from zero you know with knowing no experience no natural talent or anything and and find yourself making progress at something and I think that was a huge lesson I didn't really even know I was getting at the time, you know, at that mm -hmm. age. But I think it was powerful. I think it made a big difference for me. That's amazing. Wow. Hmm. <laughs> I love this conversation, Brian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I feel empowered, right? <laughs> good, good. So, um... You've got some new, th you're working on your, your yoga project now and you've got some new things coming up. And um, I saw on your site that you recently announced that you've been nominated for an award. Can you yeah. tell us about that? Oh, it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's a little nuts, actually. It's kind of hard for me to believe uh, because, hmm. you know, I always consider myself a flute looper and the electronics are a bonus to what I do. Um, and, but the, the flute is the vehicle for me in Ableton Live. And I worked on an RPM challenge album last February that was inspired by the sunrises in St. John's, Newfoundland and, um, collaborated with some great electronic artists from Portland, um, Sean and Kim. And we created this, this recording called Sunset Sunrise and it's been nominated for an East Coast Music Award but not just an East Coast Music Award recording it's electronic recording of the year which is really cool that's awesome <laughs> and, yeah no it's re that recording in particular um, I worked on really feeling inspired not only by the sunrise but also listening to Paul Horn's old recordings, like he's got some amazing recordings of natural reverb and delay in beautiful spots of the world, like Taj Mahal and, uh, you know, like all of these different sacred places. So I was really captivated by his, his natural delay and reverb. But then I was also quite captivated by early craft work. And so I wanted to kind of mix those two things in that recording. So it's really cool that, you know, here this super, super mellow recording got nominated for electronic recording of the year. I'm pretty stoked. And yeah, it's an honor. Yeah, congratulations. Thank and you. It, it is a cool piece of music. We'll definitely put that in the show notes for people to hear. Oh, thank you. Um, very meditative, really, um, where it's, um, you know, just it's a pretty long piece and v very like uh, atmospheric. I th and uh, like hearing you say how it's inspired by the sunrise and sunset and the kind of progression that that takes. It's like a morph that happens with the day turning into night and vice versa. And I yeah. think the music reflects that nicely. It's this kind of like evolution, which <laughs> is pretty cool. It's so different too than any recordings I've ever done. So mm -hmm. it's kind of funny that now I'm doing a yin yoga album because I don't really want to be, you know, <laughs> doing mellow music my entire life. But yeah. uh, it's been nice to, you know, spend the month of February actually working on some music that makes me feel good. Yeah, I like doing that kind of stuff a lot where I kind of dabble in other worlds of music. I mean, just the fact that I do anything that I do now is quite a departure from like, you know, the rock and roll guitar music that I've, you know, always loved and grew up playing. But, um, you know, um, just having fun with sound and trying new things, I think it really opens up other doors. And it also kind of just feels refreshing when you come back to the thing that you sort of feel at home in too. 
And I find every time I return to like a different thing that I start playing around with, it feels a little more like home. Yeah. And you're a little yeah. more comfortable in it. And uh, yeah. yeah, the ambient music has been something I've been more and more interested in, kind of a uh, hypnotic, like uh, sometimes like rhythmless music almost, which is um, just interesting. Um, where it's about texture more than anything else. So, the, yeah. Texture and color. Color. I love yeah. color. Playing with colors. Yeah, I guess like the, the visual aspect is a nice tie-in with that too, you know, creating the worlds like we spoke about. It's just sometimes the world is kind of still. <laughs> yeah. And it's nice to like get in there too. Yeah, totally. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's there's so much inspiration out there, you know, like um, my project before that one, it's called From the River to the Ocean. And that project was inspired by North Carolina, of all places. And I was doing this artist residency through the Kukuloris Festival. And I was so inspired by the experiences I was having there. Because as a Canadian, like, you know, all of a sudden living down south for three months, it was quite an eye-opening experience. And I had this handheld recorder that I took all over the place. And I'd record all these different sounds and so you hear all of these, you know, different things throughout the recording. But, you know, once again, it's just like going into a different world, right? And mm. and trying to share our world with other listeners and hoping that they can resonate with it. I, I think there's something really special about that. Yeah. Yeah, and you kind of capture like this piece of time and uh, bring it into your own thing, which is fun yeah. too. Yeah, and yeah. I think... A lot of the stuff like uh, we're kind of talking about is being present and being in the now. Yeah. And, and um, that is a fun thing about doing field recordings and capturing the sounds of a place that just happened to be going on while you just happen to be there and so cool. letting them like kind of be part of whatever it is you're doing, ex accepting again, you know, bringing that yeah. stuff in um, is is fun. And I think those are like, always some of my favorite things on recordings when I, when I like, you know, get to really know things really well. I, the Beatles always would have like something weird that you notice and oh yeah, yeah. Like, uh, like that. I heard him yelling in the background of before the change or something and just fun stuff that you, you know, it sort of gives it like a longer shelf life. Whereas yeah. if that stuff is all cleaned up and not in there, you know, there's that replay value is lost a little bit. Oh, totally. I had a, a really cool experience over the weekend, actually, because as I was recording these alto flute parts, my husband, we do a long distance marriage. So he lives in North Carolina and I live here and we see each other like once every three or four months. And so once in a while, he'll, he'll send me cool stuff. And on the weekend, he sent me this iPhone recording that he had taken uh, at a place where he was house sitting. And it has the sound of the chimes and it's like so beautiful. The, the wind was like just so gentle and it was just making the chimes sing in this like super mellow way. And you can hear the birds from North Carolina in the recording as well. Mm. Ever since he gave me that, I was like, I got to use that. I got to, I got to put that in this recording. And I have. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Which is, is so cool. What are you using that for? Oh, that's for my current recording. Yeah, oh, cool. one love and let be. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool because I feel like so you've got like all these different poses and you're lying down, and so you kind of get this like time to trip out, you know, after you're in each pose and and so in the music, I'm like taking people on a journey, and it's like it can't just be flute. Like there's got to be this journey that happens from pose to pose because I want people to like experience this kind of vibe that happens all over the body and so the moment is perfect when these chimes come in in the one spot of this recording because it's just that oh right okay i'm one with nature and mm. like here you know yeah it's it's cool it's fun I, I love the kind of just random rhythm of the wind chimes it's a uh, fun like you know nature's playing the instrument i've been enjoying a lot of 
doing a lot of music, um, you know, that I'm recording into live into a DAW, but where there's no concern for the timeline whatsoever. Um, just uh, yesterday, and this will be dated by the time people hear it, but um, I put out a collection of um, wavetable presets for Ableton Live's new wavetable. I collaborated with a bunch of other producers that they all created a few patches and it wound up being 32 when we all combined our work. And um, I, I needed just like a little music for like the voiceover I was doing in my video. So I just decided I was gonna use one patch from each person which is a limitation, which is, I think, important too, because it, it prevented me from keep adding and going and going and gave me a place to arrive to. But um, I decided to not have any sort of like real rhythmic thing going on and not no BPM, no tempo. And it was just really fun to like play along with that even because there are like, you know, there are times when I'm hitting chords, where there are times when like things happen. It's real short, but... Um, to just sort of kind of feel it out, let the parts kind of melt into each other and the rhythm just kind of flow was really nice. And it's something I'm finding myself enjoying more and more is just to kind of not worry about that stuff as much and just make this kind of fluid sound. Um, I don't know how I got onto that, honestly, but <laughs> that's a good example of me talking, not knowing where I was going to end up. But <laughs> the idea of like just being free and letting it just kind of happen and then the next pass on a different sound is like a little bit of a reaction to that. And it's not thought out. I didn't spend very long doing it, but really enjoyed the process a lot. Yeah, it's such a gift to, I think our listeners know when something's natural. It's kind of like hearing somebody who's taking, you know, these perfect vocal takes, but they sound forced, or listening to a singer that just is singing from their natural place, their their own personal voice. And like, I'd much rather listen to somebody who's singing from the heart. I think that's a really hard thing to capture in yourself because mm -hmm. you, uh, you know, I think especially with voice too, it's like a, an instrument people are very sensitive to, um, mm -hmm. to know like when it's okay and when it's, um, you know, needs to be fixed can be really tough. Yeah. Um, and, and now we're getting so used to hearing everything be so perfect that, um, yeah, it's it's tricky, but you're right. Like, there's something that we connect with so much more. Whereas when it's too perfect, there's that like illusion you have to get past first. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Oh my gosh, flute is so much like that too. It's like I feel like flute is so hard to record for that reason mm -hmm. because I can tell immediately if what I'm playing is sincere or not sincere. Like if I'm really just trying to force out certain melodies and sounds and rhythms. And, but when I all of a sudden catch that moment of, you know, true creativity, it's like, those are the precious moments in the recording. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they are at odds with the perfection and the timing and the tuning maybe, but <laughs> it's, to know when you have that is, um, can be tough and tricky and, uh, sometimes it's just kind of letting it happen and just moving on. And I, I think a lot of times I don't know that happened until later. Yeah, that's true, <laughs> Listening true. back, I was like, oh, that actually was cool that I messed that up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, when you listen to mixes, because I'm, I'm in mixing mode right now, so I'm like my, my head's kind of exploding with mixing thoughts. And um, I find mixing to be really grueling. I, I mm -hmm. think it's one of my least favorite parts of the recording process, actually. Um, but do you, I'm just curious, because I don't know if this is just me uh, or if this is other uh, producers, but I get really nervous to listen to my mixes before I start putting them on to, uh, to jump into it. What do you like? How do you mean, like, before you put it on for someone to hear? Is that what you're saying? No, it's like... Okay, so in my process right now, like I've just spent, you know, two straight days okay. just flute. And now I, you know. I have to listen to what you did. 
talking all day. <laughs> and at some point tonight, I actually have to put on the headphones and like take those editing yeah. notes. Like, how do you feel about that when you've recorded a bunch of takes and, and like, do you procrastinate or do you get excited about it? Um, probably both. Um, I find, you know, getting started, as I said earlier, is often the hard thing to do to like, okay, I'm going to do it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that can be tough. Um, I tend to these days though, I do listen to stuff quite a lot that I do. It's so easy to export what you have for the day and put it on your phone and listen to it in the car. I do yeah. a lot of that. Okay. So I think I'm actually doing a lot of like mixing and composing in the car, kind of in my head a little bit. You know, I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound right. That I need something here, and I have an idea. They, a lot of that happens. Yeah. Um, I I kind of am with you a little bit where I think um, I I do like mixing. It is fun, but it's also like one of the more technical parts of it, and I don't always want to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, there can be times where I'm like, I get a little excited. I want to try some things out, maybe, but um. When it's just like kind of okay, like here we go, it's like surgery or something. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that's my favorite part of the whole process. You know, I, I definitely like the exploration and the uh, discovery parts, but um, I think I, I like a lot of this. I, I can kind of get in the zone once I force myself to try to get into the zone. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, like. And plus what you're doing too is you're shifting gears now and it's a different, um, you know, a whole different process which requires like a whole different mindset where you sort of have to like be okay with what you did. And um, I don't know if maybe that's where the nerves are coming in where it's like, I hope Always. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think uh, to just... There is a little bit of like the acceptance, the letting go. Um, but yeah, I think all this stuff is like nerve wracking. I think that's why I can find excitement about the dishes and the laundry when it's time to make music. Because it is like, it's always a little scary to do something like, and there's almost always a time, and sometimes it's the whole time, where you feel like everything you're doing is garbage or you don't like it or you're uncomfortable with it or it doesn't sound as good as this little thing you just heard that someone else just put out. Now that hap that's a good reason to turn off social media and everything too because you can easily just, someone else puts out a track and you're like, oh, <laughs> I'm a hundred million years behind that person. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, it's, mixing is daunting because that's uh, where you're tying it all together yeah. and you it's can't really hear it for the first time ever. Yeah. As the person that did all the recording, like you just don't get that luxury of someone that yeah. comes in with fresh ears and be, and can just make easy decisions too. Like, uh, yeah, that flute is garbage. I'm taking that one out of the mix. And you're like, but that's the one I slaved over all weekend. You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> you're married to it. You invested into it. Yeah, totally. Like, so speaking about that, like um, for myself, I find it really important to mix with an engineer who I really admire. Um, I also really like to get mastering done with somebody I really admire. Mm -hmm. um, just to have that fresh set of ears at this stage, because I am so attached yeah. to the mixes I have when I go into the studio. Um, how do you feel as an electronic music producer that is capable of doing all your own mixing and mastering to the level that you want it to be? Like, do you ever hire other producers to mix and master your stuff or do you do everything on your own i've never hired anybody i've had people listen and tell me what they think and that yeah. i think is very valuable um, yeah. to get some other sets of ears um but i i do think it's a good idea um i know that it would probably be smart to do that but i think i'm also i've somehow convinced myself that I like things a little rough around the edges. <laughs> uh, so I don't get as caught up in that as much. And a lot of times the recordings I do, I am purposely trying to kind of um, dirty up and 
give a maybe an old vintage vibe to, or you know, I'm not really doing anything where it needs to be like you know, like super clean and perfect. Um, so that I mean that I know that is in some ways too. That is a little bit of like a uh, like a, something I'm hiding behind, maybe. You know. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's some of that in there as well. I do genuinely enjoy like recordings that are kind of full of character and imperfections, but it's a very slippery slope. I mean, character and imperfections can easily become like annoying and um, painful, to, literally physically to listen to because certain frequencies are punching out at you. Yeah. Um, so I've never really hired anyone. Um, I mean, we've hired people. We we're in bands. We earlier in the days before we knew how to do any of this stuff, we hired people. But um, yeah, now that I, I haven't done that in a long time. Wow, yeah. it's so different, right? Like, yeah, it's so different. I I just find I can't keep up with the technology and how quickly it's changing. <laughs> Yeah. That yeah. for me, yes, I use Ableton and I love Ableton. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine using anything else for what I do. But I don't really want to fill my brain with all of that knowledge in those areas. I really want to keep it more towards the creativity. So for me, it's, you know, gain the second set of ears, but it's also accepting for myself that yeah my focus needs to be in the creativity and i'm going to work with people i really trust to yeah. do great mixes and masters now with that being said i'm there in every stage and i'm listening and taking notes and saying everything i need to say as a producer but um but yeah i find it's it's really helpful to have that extra person that fresh set of ears that's just adding their little magical touch, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's nothing like that, having that extra person, because they hear it for the first time and they hear it differently. And yeah. they don't care how hard it was for you to play that part if it's not gonna fit. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I think uh, the, uh, like, I th maybe it's marketing or something that gets us feeling like this, I mean, for me, I kind of uh, have built a lot of what I do on keeping up with what's going on in the technologies. I mean, just if I want to be an Ableton certified trainer, I have to know Live 10. <laughs> you know, we, we just got recertified for it. <laughs> so I have to if I want to keep that going for myself. But I don't think that's something people have to do. I mean, people were making great albums on you know, software that came out in 2003, in 2003, there's no reason you can't still do it. Um, and, I, and I take that back, even just people that weren't even using computers back when, back in the old days before they had them computers. And when the people, they were making great records without that too. I mean, you don't need that. that and that's not something really the average listener is even thinking about how you made it and what technology you used. Um, I it's think so interesting well, as an artist though, Brian, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, it's sure. like, I feel like as an artist who's somewhat limited on technology, like I, I, I know enough to get by and I know enough to program my own electronics. But with that being said, I can't believe the number of times I've actually let that mindset of, well, I don't know how to do this in Ableton Live, so I'm just not going to explore that further. Mm -hmm. And it, it's amazing how so many of us artists use that as a crutch to hold our creativity back sometimes. Do you find that? Oh, yeah. The, there's the like, well, I'll, I'll, I need this one other piece of gear and then I'll be able to make my hit, you know? Right. And that's just nonsense. I've seen that not work for me a million times. <laughs> so firsthand, I can tell you, that I'm, I'm surrounded by things that was supposed to... Uh, make me great <laughs> but um i mean they're useful tools a lot of times but i think that that sometimes is like fighting the insecurity too where i i need that thing to do this i need this for that um but there's you don't have to stay up with everything and i mean 
if you're able to make good music with some piece of gear that's obsolete, but it still works for you, then who cares? You know, you're doing it. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's even those, like, once again, those happy accidents, you know, it's like, um, for example, I remember working with an engineer on from the river to the ocean. And at that time I, I, you know, was still trying to wrap my head around how to program all of my beats. And so I probably do something that's like, just like so backwards to all of you wonderfully trained Ableton <laughs> folks who teach us so much. And that's, I would, you know, take these simple beats that I had programmed and I knew it was too repetitive. And then all of a sudden I didn't know what I was using in any of the audio effects, but I would start adding this and start adding this and start adding this. And I would just do it old school. I would just run through it, play around with it, save that, bounce it, run through it again, play around with it, save it, bounce it. And when I was talking to this engineer at the studio, he's like, I've never heard this recorded this way. I've never, how do you create these beautiful mm -hmm. soundscapes? And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> That's how I've done it. <laughs> hey, that happens a lot. And I think sometimes our own knowledge gets in our way of doing things and experimenting and trying different things. Um, when I was learning guitar, I was taking lessons and learning a little bit of theory along the way. And I was also teaching my, one of my best friends how to play guitar, and he wasn't taking any lessons at all. He was just, I was basically showing him how to, where to put his fingers to play the power chords that I could solo over. <laughs> but he would go home and then start fooling around with what I'd shown him and making up songs. And he'd come back and play like these things, like that's not in the key, you can't do that. You're not supposed to bend the chord like that. Like all these things you weren't really supposed to do that I knew better to do you know i i know you're not supposed to do that that note doesn't go in that key but i'd hear him and then i'd be like but that sounds awesome <laughs> and it was like kind of humbling to like be like huh like you know so i wouldn't have done that because i know i'm not supposed to but he did it because he didn't know he was supposed to and it sounds awesome and it was a cool thing to do and um i think sometimes the not knowing what you're doing is a really good thing it, it allows you to go places you wouldn't know to go to yeah it's like it's kind of like if uh i don't know you're like driving on a, the interstates all the time because you know they're the fastest roads but you never see anything <laughs> when you yeah. take i don't know if it's a good comparison or not but it's yeah. um it can be really good to just fool around with things and kind of I'm always amazed at what people do and there's so many different ways to get to the, to wherever you're going and um, I've seen people do things that yeah it might seem like crazy and backwards and wrong but the results speak for themselves yeah. and it sometimes becomes like a new technique I can use yeah. I think there's something to learn from everybody in their way of doing things and uh, yeah like and I'm, that's funny to hear the engineer react like that because that person probably knows, you know, the proper ways to do things and, um, you know, how to gain stage, but whatever, where the mics should go. But sometimes you get cool results by breaking the rules. Totally. Once again, it comes down to playing, right? Like, just have fun. Just yeah. Have fun. Well, I think that the knowledge sometimes takes you out of the play a little bit. Yeah. And you're yeah. not playing anymore. You're like, you know, following the steps and the you know, proper procedures. Yeah. And then yeah. you forget like, oh, it's, you know, <laughs> the, the adventure, the sense of adventure is important. Yeah. And it can, it can suck the creativity out of us. Like I, uh, you know, going from classical music training where I was like, you know, practicing six hours a day and having to get my scales perfect. And then all of a sudden, you know, when I started writing my own songs, it was like, I actually did not want anyone to teach me the guitar. I wanted to learn how to play the guitar in my own way. And I didn't want anyone to teach me how to sing. I wanted to learn how to sing with my own voice. And uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing when we can go on that journey of just really, yeah, it's self-discovery, right? It's great. Yeah, and like, you know, maybe like another kind of flip of the role I mentioned with my friend, as um, I was learning guitar and 
starting to play with different people. Sometimes I'd play with trained musicians that maybe took it in school and they read off sheet music all the time. And you'd hear them play and it'd be beautiful. But then I'd try to like write music with them or like jam or something. And they don't even know what to do. <laughs> Deer in the headlights, I right? I <laughs> remember specific <laughs> occasions with people that, I mean, when you heard them play, they sounded incredible. But when I would try to play with them, they didn't even know what to play. Yeah. Because they're they just, just used to that particular, that particular form, form of playing, form reading of the playing, music, following the song. notes, and listening to the conductor. And then when that's all away, you know, improvisation was, was nowhere to be found. It's so true. I remember Robert Dick, actually, when I was at the Atlantic Center for the Arts doing that residency with him, uh, you know, I was playing very beautifully, you know, beautiful sound, beautiful melody, all of this kind of stuff. He's like, Roslyn, do you know how to play an ugly note? Like, just mm -hmm. hammer out some notes, play something that's, like, ugly. And I'm like, uh, uh, I don't know what to do. Like, and I still feel like I'm like working towards trying to find those different sounds, you know, that can, that can pierce us in a different way than just the beautiful sounds. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And that I think is having that in your mind too, is a nice way to like kind of feel comfortable in your whatever role it is. I mean, we're probably always around people that are technically more advanced or better players or can do this or that better. But it, it's also good to know like there's something you have to offer too. And sometimes it's just your own perspective and experience. But to embrace that too is, is important rather than let the intimidation hit you. Um, to just find a, a place to fit in. Take yeah. away his parrot on the shoulder, make him fly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because because I think music is like kind of scary in a lot of ways, especially when you get around people that are like professionally doing one particular thing really well all the time. Um, it can be like scary, you know, like they're gonna find you out. I think that all the time. They're gonna know. They're gonna catch on. <laughs> um, but to try to like understand that there is something you have to offer and um you know everyone has that uh, sure. regardless and sometimes what they have to offer is that they're not being held down by all the things they know mm -hmm. that they have that kind of freedom to explore a little yeah no i totally agree with you it's like everyone has something really special to offer the world and you know i don't want to go into another tangent but you know i will say that it disturbs me sometimes how competitive people get and having this kind of lack of mentality uh, where they feel threatened by all the competition around them. And it's like, there's no competition. Everybody's got something so beautiful and special to offer mm. the world. So it's like, I just want to like give them a shake and just be like, don't worry about the speed that that person is going or don't worry about the award that person's won or you know, just all of these things that people feel threatened by. It's just, I just want to shut that all off and say, no, actually, everybody has something special to offer. Hmm. Hmm. I think we get a lot further working together than we do working against each other. Absolutely. I mean, I do think there's competition can be healthy too. Well, it, you know, it can push you, it can help you strive to be better, but um, not that kind of toxic composition, uh, competition you're talking about where it's like uh, against, um, you're against that person. It's everywhere. Like, yeah. you know, just even social media, you know, looking at people's feeds and you can just almost sense it, right? Sense this angst and it's like, I just want everyone to get along. Maybe I'm too granola. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, would that be such a bad thing if we could all be a little nicer and <laughs> friendlier and welcoming and <laughs> accepting of each other. I don't think that would make it any worse for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Everyone just turn that knob up a little bit, a couple notches. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I think that's a nice place to uh, wrap up, leave, yeah. leave ourselves with that to think about a little bit as we go into the rest of our day. And I know you have some work to do anyway. I'm afraid I'm uh, enabling your procrastination here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Um, so where can people go to uh, find your work? Is the best place your website? Wow. Yeah, I think website, you know, they can be directed to all my other social media pages. And um, yeah, I've got a band camp page, but they can also find my stuff on iTunes and uh, through CD Baby and Spotify. And okay. Easy, so you know, Rosalind McPhail at uh, dot com, excuse me. Um, and then you've got a whole bunch of links here. I see, and I'll put this in the notes, of course, awesome. for people to yeah, find. Yeah, and I mean, I'm Flute Girl on Twitter, so I always love it when people reach out to me on Twitter. It's kind of fun. Okay, nice. Yeah. yeah. Very good. So we'll put that in there too. Um, any final thoughts? Anything you want to say? Any asks of uh, people listening? Any uh, requests, recommendations? <laughs> <laughs> Big questions. Yeah, um, kind of uh, open-ended. <laughs> right. Um, you know, really, I just want to say thank you, Brian, because, uh, you know, you're doing really amazing things in the community. And, uh, wow, I'm happy the universe connected us because <laughs> I've been an admirer of your work for quite a few years now. And, uh, yeah, keep doing what you're doing because it's totally awesome. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing how our paths collide again. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot for saying that. That means a lot. And it's, it's a bit of a feedback loop, you know, that's the kind of thing that makes me want to keep doing it. Totally. So. Totally. You really inspire, you know, not everybody speaks out about it, but I'm telling you they're there and they're appreciative always. Yeah. It's nice to, um, to run into that. It's, uh, one of my favorite things to, to see that. Like everyone, it's, I get so much out of it myself too. I think that, um, I learn an incredible amount by seeing like what people do, where the next steps they take or their own takes or their, uh, sometimes they have a better way of doing things. It's, it's great. Um, it's, I think when you give and give and you get and get, you know, it just, it comes right back around. Absolutely. I and mean, I, I always tell people like I never had anyone pay any attention to anything I did musically until I started not making that the focus <laughs> and yeah. and like you know doing other things that to try to basically uh, put myself um, where you know in this position of like how could I have helped myself just you know yesterday or you know a year ago or something like that. I think that's a fun way to think about it <laughs> sure i can tell you're a really good teacher <laughs> well thank you for saying that i i hope so <laughs> I, <laughs> I try. <laughs> sometimes uh you know it puts you through the ringer but i think that makes you better you know that makes you stronger <laughs> it's like this time of year right it's uh, like <laughs> i am basically at a never-ending existential crisis with my teaching where I'm constantly questioning everything I do, the purpose of it, the meaning, what value it has, if it's even worth doing, how to reach people. I um, Almost all the time I'm in that mind frame, <laughs> but it does help me try to figure out solutions. So uh, it's... And it, it means you care. I do care. And it, it's it's a good and bad thing sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I love how much honesty has come out in this interview. It's great. I love it. Oh. Well, what's the point if we're not being real, right? <laughs> totally. No, completely agree. Well, it's been really awesome to hang out with you. And, yes, uh, same. Yeah. Thanks so much for everything. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And I really do appreciate your time. And we'll send people your way to check out some of your music. I think um, it, there's a lot of cool, a lot of diversity in what you do, which is fun. Um and um, we look forward to seeing uh, how the project for the month goes, the RPM challenge and all of that and where you go next. So definitely keep us posted. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. So thanks so much. Thanks everyone for listening. Again, rosalindmcphail.com. That is R-O-Z-A-L-I-N-D-M-A-C-P-H. AIL.com. I will put that in the show notes. It's a lot of letters. But um, yeah, check it out. Lots of cool music, good inspiration, and just uh, another person with a good attitude about making music. <laughs> All right. So we'll say our goodbyes to everyone listening, and then we'll wrap up after that. So thanks for listening, everybody, and have a good day. <laughs>